I want you to imagine for a minute that you are out for a walk, walking down the sidewalk. Maybe you've just parked and you're walking to an Astros game. Maybe you're going to work. Someone you don't know comes up to you. Excuse me. You turn and look at them to see who's talking to you. They look friendly. They look like they have something to say. Maybe they're ready to ask you a question. And the words that come out of their mouth are, are you saved? I can already hear you laughing. This is the point where you have a decision to make, right? And our reactions to this question are going to go in all different directions. Because there might be some of you who can name an exact day and time and place when you got saved, when you accepted Jesus into your heart, whenever you became a Christian. There's a million ways that people say it. Or maybe you're one of the people who says, yeah, I'm saved. I got saved five years in a row at church camp. <laughs> took a second, but you got it. <laughs> On the other hand, if someone asks you if you're saved, you might roll your eyes so hard that you see your brain. Some of you might think, saved from what? Saved from who? I'm obviously not saved from awkward conversations like this. Do I look like I need saving? And are you the one that's going to do it? Because if I had my way, you're the one that needs saving from me now. No. Are you saved? We're in the last week of a series called Evangelism and Other Dirty Church Words, each week digging into the words and ideas and phrases that have long been associated with people and communities that follow Jesus. But maybe in the way these words and ideas and phrases get used, or maybe the people that are using them, they've become words that we don't always like to talk about. They make us uncomfortable, and if we're honest, some of these words and ideas and phrases, we just like to avoid them altogether. But part of the thing that's at the heart of this series is that although we might want to avoid these words and ideas and phrases, we cannot. We, the church, have to be able to make sense of these words and ideas, even if they are words and phrases that we ourselves will not use. Maybe if they feel like a holdover from another time, or maybe there's these words, or maybe at home in another part of Christianity's family tree. But we have to be able to make sense of these and the ideas behind them, or else we're avoiding an important part of what has come before us. And we, the church, cannot afford to have the identity of being people that do not know ourselves or ignore a part of what's supposed to be a part of our faith. This week, obviously, you may have guessed, we are digging into that phrase, saved. Are you saved? Talking about questions of salvation and what is it and how do we talk about it and what does it mean? We're going to jump into a, a pretty well-known verse in the New Testament. You may have heard it before. And we'll jump into this idea of what does it mean to say that one or you or me or anyone is saved. Our reading today comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 8, 9, and 10. You are saved by God's grace because of your faith. This salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possessed. It's not something you did that you can be proud of. Instead, we are God's accomplishment, created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. May God bless the reading and the hearing and the understanding of this scripture and God's people said, Amen. I cannot hear these verses from Ephesians and not think of one of my childhood Sunday school teachers, Kim Bowers. Uh, Kim Bowers was my Sunday school teacher somewhere in elementary school, third, fourth grade, somewhere around there. And one Sunday, our lesson was about what it really meant to be a Christian. And in the questions and answers of kids, to, uh, kids Sunday school, the distractions and the comments, Kim landed somewhere like this. I'm paraphrasing. She said, to be a Christian is to put your faith in Jesus, to believe in Jesus. But part of what you have to do is you have to do good things too. And this didn't sit right with me because I had read the Bible. My parents had been sending me to this thing called Awana. Has anyone ever heard of Awana? Yeah, it's kind of like Jesus Cub Scouts uh, where you get badges for memorizing Bible verses. Um, and I knew I had memorized verses like the one in Ephesians that said, you don't get saved by doing good things. It really comes down to faith in Jesus, having faith in Christ. That's what makes you saved. But Kim Bowers insisted, you have to do good things too. 
You have to do good things too. So I did what any normal third grade kid would do. I sat down at the computer and I wrote my Sunday school teacher a letter, several pages long, quoting scripture and making my case for why being saved and salvation of being a Christian does not depend on us doing good things. Is it any wonder I've ended up where I am today? I want to tell you, don't worry, I've mellowed out in my old age. I'm not that fiery third grader I used to be. And at the center of my letter telling my Sunday school teacher she was wrong, I used this verse from Ephesians that I've just read to you. I didn't do it in this nice updated English. I had it memorized in the King James Version. Thank you very much. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Still got it a little bit. When we talk about being saved, salvation, what God calls us to onwards to and who to be in the way that we live our lives, we are always going to run up against this question, this relationship between faith and works and actions. What is the relationship between those? Because there has to be some good action in there, right? Or else you've maybe not put your faith in a good thing. And if you say you believe in the right things and the good things and the God of truth and grace and mercy, but you don't do any good things, then what good are you? But the thing is, this relationship between faith and works, it wasn't just something that started in that third grade Sunday school classroom. This goes back to the very earliest days of the church. In the 4th century, there was a British theologian whose name was Pelagius. And Pelagius didn't exactly go with the flow of a lot of Christian thought of his day. Pelagius, his idea, his main idea is that God is good. So why would a good God make something not good? Why would a good God make a creation, um, a, a person who can unravel and choose to do bad? Isn't that something maybe a not totally good God would do? Pelagius played out this idea to basically say his idea was that people are basically good because we are created by a good God and we can choose to live as good people. We can be saved people by our own willpower of living in a way that lines up with the commandments of God. This was not really the main, uh, this was not what most Christians thought in this day. If you want to look at the anti-Pelagius, uh, you can look at a man called Augustine, whose ideas were almost opposite. That people are basically bad. We're selfish. We're greedy. We're sinful. We will harm each other if we feel like we can get something out of it. And Augustine would write that we cannot do things according to our own willpower. We require the help, the guidance, the goodness, and the grace, and the love of God to help us be transformed into the best version of ourselves, which is who you are living in the image of Jesus Christ. It's not something you can do of your own willpower. Things played out with Pelagius. He was eventually kicked out of the church for being a heretic. Um... But ultimately, this idea, this conflict between faith, belief, what do you invest your life into? What do you agree with in terms of who God is in Jesus Christ? Set against trying to work your way to salvation or being saved have long been in conflict with one another. Even to the ideas, y'all laughed at my joke about getting saved at church camp five years in a row. But I think that where Methodists have long run into conflict with this is that ultimately we know that people have to make that choice for themselves. When we baptize infants, we say, we ask the parents, will you raise this child as a follower of Jesus and in this church so that one day they may proclaim for themselves faith in Christ? We know that people have to make a choice. But let me ask you this, if we were to have an altar call every Sunday and I were to say you have to say this magic prayer that makes you saved, if your salvation starts with the prayer that you're repeating after me, is that salvation that begins with your own action? There are many ways that we talk about getting saved, whether it's from street preachers or church camp or going to church, that are really this Pelagian idea wrapped up in modern words. That that being saved begins with your action, what you choose to say, what you choose to say you believe in. 
But that's not really the idea of being saved that, put, that Paul puts forward in Ephesians in the verses that I read. You are saved by God's grace because of your faith. The salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possessed. Notice the grammar here. I know nobody likes to hear those words come out of a pastor's mouth, but it doesn't say you will be saved because of your faith, but you are saved. It is done. It is accomplished. It has already happened. Faith is in some way not making salvation happen, but it is the awareness that it has already been done for you. It is God's gift. It's not something you possessed. It's not something that you've done that you can be proud of. It has nothing to do with you and everything to do with what God has already done for you. One thing you might not realize about these verses, it's hiding beneath the surface, is that when Paul writes you, he's not writing in the singular. He's not writing to an individual. He's not saying you have been saved and you have been saved and you have been saved. I think, I think we can understand it if we speak a little Texan here. What Paul is writing is saying, y'all are saved by God's grace. Not you. It's not something you have to pray at summer camp. It's not something you have to decide. But Paul is speaking to the whole community, the whole church at Ephesus. Y'all are saved because of God's grace or by God's grace. That might be well and good. And we can speak to how we build community on this idea, but we still haven't answered that question that we asked the pretend street preacher from my opening, and that is, saved from what exactly? When Paul writes to this early church in Ephesus, he's writing to a divided church. Most of the churches that Paul writes to are a divided church because they are still trying to figure out who they are in this new identity as followers of Jesus. Let's back up a little bit, see what happened before we dropped in. Paul begins the chapter by saying this, at one time, y'all were like a dead person because of the things you did wrong and your offenses against God. You used to live like the people of this world. You followed the rule of a destructive spiritual power. This is the spirit of disobedience to God's will that is now at work in persons whose lives are characterized by disobedience. At what time you at one time you were like those persons. The way this would have been heard most likely by this ancient community is you had a people who still thought of themselves as Jews but wanted to follow Jesus, and you had Gentiles who had never been Jewish and now didn't want to be, thank you very much. And the Jews, in the ways they had their law and the way that they thought of themselves, they were above the ones who weren't. They were a little better than the Gentiles. So when the Jews are hearing these words saying, at one time, you were like a dead person. You used to live like the people of this world. You were disobedient to who God was. There's a chance that in their minds, this is the story of how God has brought people who weren't God's people into the story of God's people. The Jews had always been God's people, but now some other people could come in by the grace of God. So what might have been heard here in terms of being saved or being made better or being the people God had created them to be, the Jews are saying that now you can be a part of us, the ones who got it right. But the very next word that Paul writes, he says, all of you, all of you used to do whatever felt good and whatever you thought you wanted so that you were children headed for punishment just like everyone else. In that moment, Paul collapses this narrative that you were right and you were wrong, but through the grace of God, you who are wrong can now be like the ones who are right. If you go back to the King James Version in which I had this memorized, um, it's a little more blunt and on the nose that all of you were children of wrath. All, you are a divided community. You are a different community. You didn't grow up in the same ways. You didn't follow the same laws. You didn't worship God in the same way. But all of you have done wrong. All of you have chosen yourselves over others. All of you have exploited or coerced or taken advantage of someone. All of you have done something you shouldn't have done. And all of you have not done something you should have done. However, Paul writes... God is rich in mercy. He brought us to life with Christ while we were dead as a result of those things we did wrong. He did this because of the great love that he has for us. You are saved by God's grace. 
plain as day right there on the page. And God raised us up and seated us on the heavens with Jesus Christ. God did this to show future generations of the greatness of his grace by the goodness that God has shown us in Christ Jesus. That all sounds good, but we have to wonder if Paul's being a little ambitious. Because in Paul's mind, all of this has already happened. All of the grace has already done all of its work and the church is redeemed. I think you can look at the church through its last 2,000 years. It hasn't always been that group of people that's been raised up and seated at the right hand of Jesus Christ. But that's how deeply Paul believes in grace for the community. That Paul says, God has not just given you tips and tricks on how you can get yourself saved and leave the world behind one day. Paul is showing this church that God has started a new thing, a new creation, a new way of living, a new social reality. And the thing is, the church that knows the gospel of Jesus Christ, the church is in on that secret. We know what God is doing. We know that God lifts up those who are knocked down by a brutal world to shame the strong and the powerful. There is something new and different to be done. Think about the old thing, the old normal for this ancient church. The old thing was saving yourself, doing whatever you needed to do to get ahead. But the new thing is being lifted up into grace together. The old thing was division. You're not like me and I'm not like you. The old thing was purity tests. Unless you do things my way, you're not right. But the new thing in this new way of living out grace is peaceful difference united by Jesus Christ. Peaceful difference united by Jesus Christ. That we can be people who look different, come from different backgrounds, think differently, vote differently, see the world differently, have different stories to tell. But we can be united in peaceful difference because of this new grace, this new thing that God has done in Jesus Christ. Maybe another way of saying it is that when we talk about being saved, we're not just talking about somewhere we go when we die. But we're talking about through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the grace of God can save us from the worst versions of ourselves together. And I think you have to have both dimensions of that. Each of us have a worst version of who we are. Maybe it's impatience. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it is addiction. Maybe it is all, num many, all manner of things that we can do to hurt the people who are around us and find ourselves far from the vision and call that God has placed on our life. But I think the same thing is true of groups. That any group, any church, any organization has a worst version of itself that can give in to fear and infighting. That can go out looking for an enemy instead of looking for people to serve and help and love. There are many ways that we as individuals and we as a group can give ourselves over to a worse version of who we are. But that through Jesus, through salvation, through this new thing God has done, through being saved through grace and love, we are saved from that worse version of ourselves because of what God has done for each of us, but because who we can be for each other as well. One author I read this week said, the idea of being saved is cosmic and communal, not otherworldly and individual. And what I think they meant by that is this. When we talk about saved, we don't talk about someone or something or some God that is out there otherworldly and who grants that salvation, that being saved to the individual. But when we talk about being saved in salvation, it doesn't just have to do with you or you or you or you, but it has to do with the total redemption of all that is, and that's going to be done together. In other words, our salvation, our being saved doesn't start with us or what we say or what we do or how we think we might be able to save ourselves. But our being saved is bound up together. There's a famous story in uh, uh, Dostoevsky's book, The Brothers Karamazov, um, that is told by the character of Grishinka, and it's called The Onion Story. I want to read that to you real quick. Once upon a time, there was a peasant woman and a very wicked woman she was. And she died and did not leave a single good deed behind. The devils caught her and plunged her into the lake of fire. 
So her guardian angel stood and wondered what good deed of hers he could remember to tell God. Uh, she once pulled up an onion in her garden, said he, and gave it to a beggar woman. And God answered, You take that onion then, hold it out to her in the lake, and let her take hold and be pulled out. And if you can pull her out of the lake, let her come to paradise. But if the onion breaks, then the woman must stay where she is. The angel ran to the woman and held the onion out to her. Come, he said, catch hold and I'll pull you out. He began to cautiously pull her out. He had just pulled her right out when the other sinners in the lake, seeing how she was being drawn out, began catching hold of her so as to be pulled out with her. But she was a very wicked woman, and she began kicking them. I'm to be pulled out, not you. That's my onion, not yours. And as soon as she said that, the onion broke. And the woman fell into the lake, and she is burning there to this day. So the angel wept and went away. This is for me and not you. I think that's a one way that being saved has been talked about by a lot of people in a lot of different ways. This is for me, not you. But I believe that when we do the work that God has called us to, it's in that moment that we see someone, whether they look different, worship different, or of a different religion, no matter how they live or how they work or who they love, it's at the moment where we look at someone and say, this is for me and not you. That's when the onion breaks. That's when the good works break. That's when the good things that we do as followers of Jesus break. Because ultimately those good works are not really about what God will give us, but they are about who else can we pull out of some misfortune. How are the ways that we do good works not going to get us what we want, but how are those the ways that God works through them, working through those onions to pull other people to something new? And uh, if my Sunday school teacher, Kim Bowers, was here today, I would say, I think this is what you were trying to teach me all those years ago. And that maybe I didn't know everything when I was in third grade, uh, or even now for what, for that matter. But that ultimately, because of what God has done for us, we cannot help but do that for others. The works that we do, the actions that we take, they do not make us saved, but they do tell the truth about what we think has saved us from a worse version of ourselves. They make manifest the person of Jesus Christ for people who do not know him. I think that's what she was trying to teach me. That to, full, to be a Christian is not to go out and do good works in the hopes of what we will get, but because of the grace and love we believe God has given to us, we cannot help but reach out to pull other people out of misfortune and pain and suffering. This is the new reality, the new thing that God has started. That we are saved from worse versions of ourselves, not individually, but together. That our fate, our destiny, our saving is bound up with one another, not just for ourself. And that through the ways we choose to live as a community of peaceful difference, united by the power and grace and love of Jesus Christ, in that we can be saved from a worse version of ourselves. And because of that, the next step of that is that we go out to do good works, to buy school supplies, to worship together. To go to Nacogdoches and build no matter what hurricane may come. To be a church and a place where anybody, no matter who they are, can walk in the door. Because we know the things that we stand on, the truths we have built our lives upon. They are for everyone. It is not something we can preach about today and say, this is for me and not you. We are God's accomplishment. Created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. 